Hello and welcome to Keeping It Young Podcast, conversations about marriage, family, and ministry life. I'm Dave. And I'm Bethley. And we are the Youngs. We are so glad you've joined us again as we continue our trek through the book of Proverbs. And my friends, we hope you have enjoyed this series with us. And we are in Proverbs 22.6 and kind of winding that up today. Proverbs 22.6 is that great verse that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And it's such a, a just such a simple verse. And, and Solomon is writing these great words of wisdom to us to help us to live a happy life, a God-blessed life, and how to have a happy family or a God-blessed family. And of course, we've covered a ton of material. And uh, we are winding down the book of Proverbs. <laughs> I promise you, dear friends, that we are winding down. I don't know. And uh, it just keeps going. <laughs> it does. It keeps going and going. But really, um, next we are going to start covering Proverbs 31, which is the last chapter. And I mean, it's chock full of stuff. We could probably go a long time there, but I think we'll try to keep it pretty short. And we might, this is just a little teaser, we might be able to bring Charity in on that conversation because Charity and I had a great conversation just the other day about Proverbs 31. And I loved some of her insight from a young woman's perspective. So. Yeah. And she's been reading that proverb a day that we challenged you about last week. Yes. And she had just finished reading through Proverbs. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think it'd be a great uh, asset to get her on here. And so we're going to certainly try to do that. Last week, we we ended, we were talking about the goals we should have as parents, and our goal in training our children is to have, that, there, that our children have good behavior. Yes. So we were talking about how to have good behavior, how to train your children, and we, we talked about they have to learn to obey. There's an expectation there. There's a communication there. There's a follow-through. There's a correction. And uh, one of the things that we ended kind of on a, you know, a little bit of a heavy note there, because the idea of spanking in our generation and the Bible uses some pretty strong words because what he's dealing with there is that sometimes our children's behavior is going to damage them so badly if we don't correct it right. that it can literally lead them away from God to an eternity in what Proverbs wrote there, an eternity in hell. Mm-hmm. And so it's a serious matter, moms and dads. Your training is not just a little thing. It is one of the most important things that you will do as a dad and mom. It is. Train, train, train. And one last thing before we jump into the second truth. The first truth was we want our children to have good behavior. Uh, One of the things that I found in the book of Proverbs is that disobedience, disobedience produces blindness. Because there's a verse that says that the eye that mocks its father and, and will not obey, that the raven shall pluck it out and the young eagle shall eat it. And it's such a strange verse because it's obviously not true. Mm. You've never seen ravens or eagles, you know, plucking out eyeballs and eating them because I'm a child is rebellious. Really glad I've never seen that. And 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 sometimes it's interesting to me because we have occasionally in our uh, conferences, as I've taught about Proverbs twenty two six and training children, we've had many people come to us and really get on to us about using Proverbs twenty two six as a strong verse of encouragement for families, which is so weird to me because it's such an encouraging verse and it's been the normal way to see the verse for most of church history. Train yes. your children, train your children, train your children, train your children. Well, it always makes me kind of scratch my head because I'm thinking to myself, you are training your children. Whether you are training them biblically or not, you are training your children. So why is that such a debate? So what, what some people do is they come with that verse about the ravens and the eagle eating the eyeballs and all of that. And they'll say, see there, the Bible's not literal because that doesn't really happen. But the, the verse has meaning. Every mm-hmm. verse has meaning. Yes. And although that is not a literal verse, it does have meaning. And what it teaches us is that when our children are left to themselves, when our children are not trained properly, the result is they lose their sight. Because the Bible talks about the birds, they're plucking out the eyeballs and eating them. And what we know is that when a person loses their sight, it results in at least three things. Number one, they have no defense. And our children are being attacked by the enemy relentlessly in our generation. And when our children are not well-trained, they're blind. They have no defense. And then secondly, they have no discernment. They, when, when a person has no sight, they, they can't tell where the next step is. We've all been carrying groceries downstairs yes. and thought there was one more step at the bottom when there <laughs> wasn't. And, and it, you know, it's an awkward little thing there where we almost crash and burn right. with all the groceries in our arms. But the point is we had no discernment there. We couldn't tell depth because we couldn't see. So there's no discernment. There's, there's certainly no direction. 
uh, or no defense, and there's also no direction. Mm -hmm. a, a person who can't see has a really hard time knowing what direction to go because there's nothing they can see. Right. And moms and dads, what Solomon is writing there is he didn't throw in that verse about, you know, eagles and ravens plucking out eyeballs and eating our children's eyeballs because they're they're rebels. He doesn't throw that in there to undermine Proverbs 22, 6 and to let us know that we should ignore that verse. He throws that in there for us to learn yet another principle to, of parenthood. Yes. It matters because mm -hmm. if your children are disobedient and are, are not doing what they should do, it results in great damage to their life. Right. And, and we have seen this even in our children's lives where there has been some place where maybe an older child has made a decision that they should not make. And we maybe weren't around to help them with their influences, with all the, the different things that they were believing, lies they were believing. And then we have had to kind of rescue them back in. We have seen where it has taken time for that child to come back around, to not believe the lies, to have biblical discernment, to have some biblical direction, to even be happy about the direction that their parent, that his parents were trying to put into his life. You know, we have seen how that a rebellious child, a child who has not been taught to obey, or even a child who has been taught to obey, but has come under influences that they should not have, how that they just really, they wander. And then they can get so upset when faced with truth. And so we don't want that for our children. Ultimately, it may happen. We've been through it. So it is good though, to train and train and train because a child who has learned to just not be rebellious, to obey, to obey happily, they can go through life with a lot more wisdom, a lot more discernment. And, and Beth and I just want you parents to know that that doing the work and believing the Bible and just, just finding out what does the Bible say here and how can I apply that to my life? Not taking the time to say, you know, well, I'm going to disagree with so and so, or I'm not, I'm going to ignore that verse because I don't like how so and so interprets it. There's all kinds of things we end up debating in our culture and taking sides against one author or this speaker. When the fact of the matter is, your children are the key here, not who's best interpreting it. The, the ch your children are the key, and your parenting is, is what's important. Training your children to do well in life is vital. Yes. If nothing else, if you are a young parent, just grab hold of the first part of that verse. If you're going to be like, well, I don't believe that it's a promise, fine. Don't believe it's a promise, but grab hold of the first part and, and, and believe that it's a command that we are to train our children. Train your children Absolutely. in the way you should go. So what's the goal of training? Number one, we want our children to have good behavior. That's what we talked about last week. There's two more. Yes. Two more. Based on based on Proverbs 22, 6, we want our children to have good appetites. And our this children is, all have good appetites. They love to eat. They do. And it shows up in our grocery bill, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially when they're all here now as adults who are married. Oh, when they all come in. I just Ooh. love it. I oh. love going to the grocery store and filling that cart way up. It's yes, awesome. It does. But I will say they have learned their foodiness from their parents. Yes, they have. It's our fault. <laughs> yes. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Now, the, the Hebrew idea of that phrase is so important because it has the idea of the word mouth, mm -hmm. and it really is talking, best we can tell there, about appetites. We are training our children's habits, their tastes, their appetites. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament reminds us that all of us ought to have an appetite for eternal things, spiritual things, more than earthly things, physical things. Yes. Eternal things versus temporal things. Yeah, set your affection on things above. Yes, and he, he just talks about that all the time. Uh, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and all that passes away. All mm -hmm. that passes away. Yes. But, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Mm -hmm. So part of training, mom and dad, is that we take each child, and I think Proverbs is making a case there for individually. We have five Yes. And you that have more than one child would know this. Every child has a different personality, different strengths, but also a different battle with their sin nature. Uh, one child, their weakness may be dishonesty. The other child, their weakness may be stealing mm. uh, or their weakness may be laziness or their weakness may be their temper. Right. So that every one of your children are unique. And moms and dads, what you have to do is train your children individually. 
If you have an older child, you should know where, what's their weakness, what's their strength, how am I correcting their weakness and amplifying their strength so that they can serve God with it. Right. But you don't overlook your fifth child. You that have more than one, don't overlook the fifth <laughs> one or the third one. Each child, each child has to be, you know, has to have a different emphasis. Right. And you train their appetites differently too, because they will have their own appetites. You will have children who will love just to sit around and read. And you want to make sure that you're training that appetite and the right type of reading material. Then you'll have the other child who will just want to play video games all day long. And of course, you'll need to train that appetite. Yes, so we're training, training, training. And there's got to be the appetite for eternal things over earthly things. And by the way, the word mouth, before I leave that, the idea of that, uh, as far as I can tell, I've, I found at least three meanings of that. One is mouth can be the beginning of something. Mm -hmm. The mouth is where it starts. Right. The mouth can be the ending of something. I've always noticed that here where we live in the South, the mouth of the Mississippi, the mighty Mississippi, mm -hmm. uh, is usually referred to where it ends as it spills into the Gulf of Mexico. Right. That's the ending of the Mississippi. So the mouth can be the beginning, the headwaters. It can also refer to the ending. But I think the whole point of it is that it, it is the, the idea of beginning is get started right now, right away. You're in the you're get on it. Don't wait. The right. beginning. The goal is the ending. Because mm -hmm. someday we're done parenting, we're done training, we've done all the training we can do, now we have to let it go and let them go and 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 make these decisions on their own. So the mouth is the, the ending. But between the beginning and the ending is all this appetite. And uh, what are what are these areas? What are some appetites that we should be you know working to train our children in? Well, I'd say the first thing is to have an appetite for God's word, a love for God's word. And uh, we do hear from parents from time to time that are just, can I use the word distressed? That their little one does not seem to have a love for God's word, or maybe their teenager doesn't have a love for God's word. And can I just remind you that all of us are on a spiritual journey and not all of us are born, even if you're born into a Christian home, loving all of the things of the Lord. You know, as a little one, you can think church is boring. And as a teenager, you may not really get something from your devotions every time you read the Word of God. And so all of us just have to be trained in that appetite. So don't worry, parent, if you're just like, my goodness, my six-year-old knows how to read. But every time I say, have you had your devotions today? They go, no, not yet. <laughs> Well, that's okay. You're in the process of training that appetite. So don't worry about it. Don't just get distressed about it. Just keep giving them opportunity to read the Word of God and maybe train their appetite in ways that will help them. I know that there are devotionals that are available for little ones and even for teenagers. And then even as a family, make sure that you're developing that appetite as in taking them to church and being under the Word of God and having that family altar time where you talk about what you're learning in the Word of God. Yeah, so we're training them to love the Bible. Mm -hmm. and to love church. We're training them just, that's habits. That's every Sunday we're in church, uh, uh, church events, we're there. We, that's a prior, we're prioritizing the word of God and church and worship. Yes. Uh, we're, we're prioritizing a love for God. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be legalistic to where we just list a whole bunch of rules that, you know, keep these rules, you'll be fine. Right. We have proven royally that keeping the rules won't make you fine. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we want to have a right spirit towards loving God. And that does mean there's some things we can't do mm -hmm. and some things we shouldn't do. Some maybe something we shouldn't wear, some limitations that are in our life. All of that's all normal. There's movies we can't watch. Right. But we don't want to do all of that out of this legalistic mindset. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. We want to do that out of a, oh, we love God. And we know that if we honor God and make right choices of holiness and righteousness, it brings the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. We want an appetite for that. That should even start with proving to your children over and over just by maybe blessings in your life or your own love for God and his word and how he has shown his love for you. So overemphasizing to your children how much God loves them because the Bible does tell us that we love him because he first loved Absolutely. us. Absolutely. And so there's, you know, there's eternal things, God's word, God's love. There's practical things. We want to train our children to have an appetite for diligence. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, when our kids were younger, we were Patch the Pirate people. Yes. And uh, if you've never heard of Patch the Pirate, you should uh, look it up, especially if you have little ones, because the stories are great and the songs are catchy. But do you remember the one song, uh, if, if I got it, the, the idea right, if, if I'm remembering correctly, we used to sing it to our children about uh, finish the job, finish the oh, job. Oh, yes. And uh, was it get it done? Yes. And I don't remember exactly how that goes. I remember we used to sing that to our children because it was a fun way of teaching our children to have an appetite for a job well done, finish yes. the job. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and learning that makes life easier. We finish jobs. You know, take the trash out, put the trash bag back in. We clean the house, get her done, make your bed every day, finish the job. When the meal's over, clean up the you know the kitchen and have a great time doing it, so that it's all put away and that meal is over. Right. And and sometimes, so many times, you know, so many people have been taught to think about the normal everyday task that you just have to do as a as an oh my goodness I hate this. Right. But we wanted our children to learn to love it. If yes. and, and we tried to do that. One of the reasons we did clean up kitchen clean up as a family, we would put on some happy music. Mm -hmm. and we would laugh, we would sing, we would make fun, we would joke, we'd spray each other with water. (laughs) The reason we did all that is because we're wanting an appetite for diligence, finish the job. And there's a ton of others, appetites for faithfulness, Mm. doing what's right faithfully. What are are some others? Just do it right all the time. We taught our children that we may not always be with you, but God is always with you, and you always have our last name with you, so that wherever you are, you are a reflection of this family. Our children didn't always love that, but that taught them faithfulness. It taught them that you do right when mom and dad are watching. You do right when mom and dad are not watching, and even if other people are not watching, um, you be faithful. We'd say remember who you are. Yes. We taught them character. That is very important. I was thinking, as David was mentioning, Patch the Pirate CDs that we used to listen to all the time on travel days with our kids. They taught so many biblical character traits. And if you could get a hold of those, those are Mm -hmm. awesome. I know Adventures and Odyssey also teach character traits in a fun way, and it just reinforces hopefully what you as a parent are already doing. You can't just rely on Patch the Pirate and Adventures and Odyssey and other fun things like that to teach your children character traits. But it's a fun way for them to hear in a different voice, oh, you know what, this is important. It's important that I have integrity, that I have honesty, that I do right all of the time. And we taught our children to have an appetite for family. Mm. And uh, one of the one of the things we've observed in our culture is that we, especially in the teen, tweeny and teen years, For some reason, we begin to teach our children to have an appetite for friends. Right. So we emphasize that, oh my goodness, you got to have your peers and you've got to be part of the club and you got to be part of the in group and you got to be part of the event with all of your peers. And I'm not opposed to our kids having friends that are peers and being part of events, but we taught our children to have an appetite for family. Yes. Love the family, be friends with each other. Most of us who are adults are aware of the fact that rarely do your high school friends stay part of your life. Mm-hmm. And we spend so many hours with those high school friends, but the people that stay part of your life the most are your family. The older you get, the ones that's going to be there will be your family. Right. The people that show up at your funeral are often primarily family. They're the ones that come. They're family. Mm-hmm. So we these are appetites. You're training your children to have an appetite for joy, for peace, for contentment. And uh, moms and dads, that's what he's talking about. Solomon is saying, you want to have a happy family and a happy life? Then you've got to train your children to have good behavior. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a happy family and a happy life, you've got to train them to have good appetites. Right. But uh, that's not the only one. There's one more. We want our children to be successful adults. And I think that's the point of Proverbs 22, 6. It is. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, is about adulthood. Right. You're not training little adults at all. You are training children who are going to behave like children. They're going to be immature like children. But there comes a time where you want that child to start adulting, if I can use the cultural word. You want them to start doing things 
on their own without you looking over their shoulder, without you having to do everything for them. We don't believe that our children are becoming little mechanical robots. No. The idea is not this guaranteed response that if I train my children perfectly, they will have perfect character, they will be perfectly faithful, they will never make a mistake, they will never do something wrong. We're not, we're not producing little robots, but we have 18 years to train our children in their behavior, to train our children in their appetites, and to prepare them for successful adulting. Yes. And, and moms and dads, there is no greater need. We are failing to produce young people who are adults. Well, and not just in their work ethic. We can see that culturally where there are hiring signs in every business that you pass. You just see, we, we need people, we need help. And I understand that. But also just in, in emotional health, children are not growing up in a way that they are learning to deal with just everyday life. And right. so that's what you, you want to do that for your child. Why do you want to push your child out into a world being an emotional cripple or um, uh, one who has crippled in their character or in their integrity? You want a child who can go out there and handle life and handle it spiritually and biblically. Yeah. And so, so the reason you train a toddler who is responding unhappily. The reason you go to work on that is because you're training that toddler to know how to respond to life as an adult. Yes. The reason you help a kid who's in elementary school to handle issues correctly, to respond to things wisely, is because you're preparing them to be an adult. Yes. And when they're in their teen years, you're really coming down to the wire. That's when you're training your child to really begin to parent themselves. Mm -hmm. Because the best way to get our children to be successful adults is to have them already going that way before they get there. Right. Did I say that right? Yes. If your kid is, is 13 years old and already heading towards success as an adult at 13, they're going to be fine when they're 23. Yes. If your kid is 17 year old and can't handle being a 17 year old, they're rebel, they're rebellious. They get angry easily. They fly off the handle. They have no respect. They have no discernment. They can't parent themselves. The moment they're on their own, they make unwise choices. Every time your back is turned, they make an unwise choice. Moms and dads, they're not there. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a 17 year old, it's not perfect, but your 17 year old is making choices that are wise. When you're not around, you know they're aware. They're aware of their own purity, not just that you're trying to help them be pure. Mm -hmm. They're aware of right and wrong, not just that you're trying to get them to do right. right. The, the goal is sooner than later, you want your child to begin parenting themselves to right. where they do right on their own. And that's what successful adulting is all about, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Our children need to be about the business of, mm, wait just a minute. I need to think that through a little bit better. And we can do that as parents. You can start sowing those seeds when they're really tiny. Um, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, or a four-year-old should already be in the business of, you know what, I've tried that before and that didn't go so well for me. So I am going to not do whatever it is my parents didn't want me to get into or say or do. Yeah, and so and when you're thinking about this, the, the idea of getting them on going the right way before they get to adulthood, uh, remember, parents, you've just got to teach your teens to parent themselves, but you also got to know where you're taking your kids. What What is the goal, the long-term goal? Do you even have one? Why do you want your child who is three to obey happily? Do you even know why? Is it just that you're, in, you know, I've had it with you. I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. You're embarrassing me. Well, that can be part of it. But the main part of it is, according to Proverbs 22, 6, is that you're training them in the way they should go. Why? Because sometimes they're going to be an adult. Right. So train them in the way they should go because they're going to be on their own someday. Train mm -hmm. them in the way they should go because someday they have to decide this themselves. Right. And your job as a mom and dad is to do everything in your power so that they not only behave well when they're under your care, their appetites are being formed for righteousness, for eternity, for spirituality, for godliness, for holiness, but also because you're preparing them to be an adult. That's the whole point of training. And give them opportunities to prove that they are getting there. Uh, you know, trust them. Let them, you know, make some decisions to see how they will make it. Right. Uh, check up on them. You should know what your, your kids are texting. How are they doing? Mm. What is going on in their life? 
Right. If your child has a job, who is influencing them on that job? And are they standing for righteousness on that job? Right. Uh, this summer, I was very thrilled when I had a young man who asked to see me. He was 15, 16, maybe. Uh, I can't remember one of those, 15 or 16. And he asked to talk to me after service. And um, so I said, sure. And we sat down on a platform. And he said, hey, um, can you give me some advice about where I work? And I said, well, sure. And he said, uh, I actually work with my grandma. My grandma and I work in this business. He told me what the business was. My grandma and I work in this. She takes me to work with her. I work when she's there is when I work. And he said, um, the truth of the matter is, other than my grandma, everybody else I work with is unsaved. And they use language I don't use. They, they talk about things I don't talk about. And here's what he said. What would you recommend I do to have the best possible influence in their life and also protect my testimony? Mm. And and I was just thrilled sitting on a platform with a 16-year-old young man who was asking, how can I help the people I work with who are not right, who aren't doing right, who don't know God, but how can I also make sure that I'm staying on the right path in this environment? And I thought to myself, here's a young man that is already parenting himself. Right. And it doesn't mean your kids won't make foolish mistakes, but mm -hmm. the idea is let them, let them make a foolish mistake when they're 16 so that you can come alongside of them and teach them why that was foolish and how to overcome that. Don't, don't rescue your children from consequences oh, no. because consequences of, of decisions that really hurt you know, maybe, you know, now you got to pay a, you know, you, maybe you made a bad purchase there and now you got to pay it off. Right. Or, you know, you made a wrong choice there and now you got to face the music. Right. Let them do the hard thing there. And, and, and moms and dads, the, the most easy thing to do is to rescue our children from hard things. Mm. Don't do it because no. adulting is hard. It is. Let them face the music. Mm -hmm. Let them deal with the consequence. Come alongside of them and help them to handle it in a biblically godly manner. Because what you're doing, what are you doing? We're trying to attain the third goal. Right. Why, how do we have a happy family and a happy life? We have to train our children. And so you want them to have good behavior. You want them to have good appetite. Mm -hmm. You want them to be very successful adults. Yes. All right. Anything else? I don't think so. I think we have covered Proverbs 22, 6. We have in many, many venues and over the years. And so thank you for listening. I know many of you may take a different view, but we hope at least the word of God will speak to you enough so that you will know that the Lord wants you to train your children. And can we just add one more thing before we finish today? If you're a, a parent and your children are adults and they're not well, uh, the Bible, Proverbs 22, 6, does not address your situation. Mm -hmm. But what we do know as, as counselors and what we do know as people who serve families, there are several steps you can take even with an adult child who is not well. And, and the first one is so obvious. Don't overlook it. You can always pray. Yes. Make sure that you get on your knees and talk to God about an adult child that's not well. He cares. He hears prayer. He loves your children. So pray. Secondly, you can love. Make sure that your adult knows that you love them. Yes. Uh, we knew that uh, the Lord, we, we love God, the Bible says, because he first loved us. Right. And so love has to be initiated even to those who don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. So if your son or daughter is not well or your grandson or granddaughter is not well, it's not that you you just throw in the Bible and say, well, obviously the Bible didn't work. What you do is you pray. What you do is you love. And what you do is you talk. You keep the communication going. Right. And keep the door open to the heart of your child. Absolutely. And, and not necessarily always filling them up with all the biblical truth that you want to throw at them. Um, just keeping the communication open about how are you doing? How's the job? How's Absolutely. the family? And all of those different things. And then when the Lord opens that opportunity, going ahead and slipping in that Bible truth of, you know, this is what the the Bible says, and this is how the Lord would love to have a relationship with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Well, we're out of time. We have just one more small series in the book of Proverbs. We want to talk to you about Proverbs 31 and the virtuous woman. Mm -hmm. And so that's coming up, and we'll have several weeks to examine that, and then we will conclude our series in Proverbs. And then what will we I do? I have no idea. Actually, <laughs> I do. So look forward to it. We're going to be talking. we got a series, uh, at least a one podcast coming up about how to damage your marriage in one day. Mm. 
And uh, so several, just several, you know, different ones. We'll take a little different tactic here to close out the year. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, This is Keeping It Young, and we're always happy that you would be a part of our ministry and our podcast. Uh, Take time to like, to share, leave us a Leave us a review if you're able to do that. Uh, Share it with somebody, but make sure that you're putting into practice what you're learning. And uh, certainly our prayer is that you will serve the Lord with gladness. Have a great day, our friends. The Keeping It Young podcast is a Bax 5 Media production.